Now moving on to female genitalia. With our adolescent clientele, one of the things that we can see is clear drainage about six months before they get their menses. And that's considered normal, to have that clear, watery drainage. It can take about two to three years before they get their regular menstruation to occur. It's even normal to have irregular periods during that time because there's an occasion for the ovaries to misfire, not to ovulate. Mm. So they can have two and then miss one. One really important thing is we wanna educate them on perianal hygiene. Because you have the urethra, the vaginal canal, and the anus, those three openings located in very close proximity to each other. So you wanna educate the client to wipe front to back and not the other way. As well as you really wanna educate them regarding utilization of tampons and how long to keep them in. You really don't want the client to keep a tampon, which is a feminine hygiene product utilized during menstruation that's inserted into the vaginal canal. Leaving a tampon in for too long can cause toxic shock syndrome, which is something that's been tested on the NCLEX more recently lately. Another thing that can cause toxic shock syndrome is leaving a cervical cap in either for too long or also leaving it in during menstruation. And so you wanna be careful because toxic shock syndrome can even lead to sepsis. Now let's move on to talking about the menstrual history. We wanna ask our client when was their first menstrual period because it can increase the risk of breast cancer if they started it too early. We also know when was their last menstrual period because that might mean that they could be pregnant and we might need to do a pregnancy test with them. Oftentimes we do a pregnancy test on anyone at a mission unless they have documented menopause just in case that they are unaware that they are pregnant and really they are, unless there's documented menopause. We also wanna know how long are their typical periods? What's the duration? Three to seven days is average. We'd wanna know if they have menorrhagia, which is heavy menses. So important to ask about the amount of each flow. Is it light, medium, or heavy? And again, that heavy flow would be called menorrhagia. We'd also wanna know if they have dysmenorrhea. So that dys that starts, like if you have dysuria, that means painful urination. Mm -hmm. So dysmenorrhea means painful periods. And oftentimes people who have it, it really can take them out. So even you'd wanna ask, do they have any medications that they take when this occurs? Midol can be a common one, which can be a combination of acetaminophen, a diuretic, and sometimes an inset as well. So you'd wanna know what exactly they're taking because it could potentially counteract with other things as well. Hmm. Additionally, are they using any herbal teas or heating pads? Hey there, nursing student, listen up. Did you know only 20% of our videos are here on YouTube? You're missing out on over 900 videos not on YouTube, plus 500 visual study guides that follow along every video, and a massive quiz bank to test your knowledge. All neatly organized in our new app. Try it for free. Visit simplenursing.com today. Next, let's talk about some key points for the vaginal exam. A big thing to know is that the client will be placed in what's called lithotomy position. Now you may have seen this before, and it's that position where the client is on a table and both of their feet are placed in stirrups. Prior to doing the vaginal exam, you wanna let the client know the appropriate expectations. Let them know they might feel some mild pressure when doing the vaginal exam, and it's a good idea to have the client empty their bladder prior to the exam because of this. Now let's talk about amenorrhea. You have a great memory trick for this. Yes, we call it amen, no period. So there's an absence of mensi. So just think amenorrhea, amen, no period. So what is primary amenorrhea? So that's a great question because it's important to know the difference between primary and secondary. So there's two types. Primary means they've never had one. So these clients may be prepubescent. They just haven't gone through puberty yet. And then secondary amenorrhea is going to be if they had one at one point, but they don't have one now. Causes of secondary amenorrhea, a big one is birth control pills. Especially some birth control pills allow you to only have four menses a year. Mm -hmm. So then you would pause and not have a menstruation period for some months of the year. Amen, no period. Amen, no period. Another big cause for not having a period is pregnancy. 
when someone is pregnant or even when they are breastfeeding, mm -hmm. they will not have a menses. Sometimes they'll have a little bit of spotting, but oftentimes they have that amen, no period. Mm -hmm. Additionally, clients who are menopausal, once you've gone through menopause, you do not have a period any longer. Thyroid issues can also cause people to lose their menses. And then athletics, so someone who is either in gymnastics or who's had a, a large amount of weight loss or really low body fat can lose their menses. Anorexics, so that eating disorder can cause a loss of menstruation, as well as a side effect of some antidepressant. Now for a practice question. A nurse is collecting assessment data on a new client who states she does not have menses. What term will the nurse use in her documentation to describe the absence of menstrual flow? The correct answer is amenorrhea. So just think amen, no period. We have an absence of menses. Okay, now let's talk about pregnant clients here. Remember the three big issues with any pregnant clients. So number one, the baby is getting bigger. Number two, increased hormones. And number three, increased blood volume. So as that baby gets bigger and bigger, the uterus inside the abdominal cavity gets bigger and bigger as well. And it hypertrophies. So hyper, think a lot, and trophy, just think hard. So it gets getting really big and hard there. And it's going to push out and up in the abdominal cavity, out of the pubis symphysis bone area, and displaces everything. It's basically pushing that little baby, or that baby is pushing everything out of the way. So for example, the liver's being pushed out of the way, the intestines, even the stomach here. Now the greatest change is in the uterus. It increases in shape and size and becomes an abdominal organ. So we see an increase in cervical and vaginal secretions, as well as a change in pH, becoming more acidic, which keeps pathogens from multiplying. We also see an increase in glycogen and increased risk for candidiasis, basically that fungal infection. Now moving on to the blood. Due to the increased blood volume, the cervix will also change. It's gonna become more vascular and soft. This is what's known as Chadwick's sign. So I have a great memory trick for this. Mm -hmm. So Chadwick, just think of a bully named Chad. He's gonna beat you up black and blue. So the cervix is gonna turn from red, and as it becomes more vascular, it's gonna get that bluish or purplish look, or basically back and blue. Now the next one is Goodell's sign. This is a soft cervix. So normally, the female cervix feels like the tip of your nose. It's kind of hard and protruding there, right? But as pregnancy develops, it becomes soft and kind of feels like the tips of the lips there. So a good memory trick for Goodell sign is like a pillow, like when you say good night. So it's gonna change that cervix to be really, really soft here. Now these occur in alphabetical order. So C comes first for Chadwick and then Goodell's comes next, just like the alphabet. Now moving on to the mucus plug. As you guys know, the cervix is really the door to the uterus, which I call the baby condo. Now if doing a vaginal speculum exam, we're gonna be going in and taking a look at the cervix, and how is that supposed to look if someone is nulliparous? So if someone has not had any babies by their own body, when you're doing that vaginal speculum exam, it's gonna look like a glazed yeast donut. Mm -hmm. And that donut hole opening in the middle, that is our cervical opening called the OS, or the OS. Because if a client is pregnant, there will be a mucus plug in that opening. What that mucus plug does is it keeps any other sperm out. So there's already a baby growing inside of there. We don't want any additional added. So it keeps sperm out so there's just one baby or twins or uh, if there's multiples, but it also helps to keep bad bacteria out. Prior to going into labor and delivery, then that client will lose the mucus plug as that cervix begins to dilate. So the cervix, that center part, that donut hole opening dilates. If you think about with the pupils, when we talked about the pupils dilating, that means to get big. And so if you have ever heard about a, a client dilating to 10 centimeters, mm -hmm. that's talking about the center of that donut opening mm -hmm. and coming to 10 centimeters for the baby to come out. Which makes sense, you know, as the cervix dilates, the door is dilating, 
letting the baby out into the world. Now for a practice question. In which of the following clients would the nurse consider a bluish tint to the cervix an expected assessment finding? The correct answer is a client who is pregnant. Yes, this is Chadwick's sign. Remember, Chadwick's sign is that color change. So let the name help you there. Or simply think of Chad like a bully. He's gonna beat up that cervix black and blue leading to that color change. And this is due to that increased vascularity, fancy words for increased blood flow. Now moving on to our adult clients, our elderly population. So again, think of that raisin. Everything gets dried, wrinkly, and really crumpled up and stiffens up. We lose the elasticity. So the same thing happens here. During the premenopausal phase, clients start to have infrequent periods, but still release an egg monthly and can still get pregnant. Now, they still have monthly cycles, but it's not regular. And they often complain of hot flashes because of that vasomotor instability. So they're hot for one second and then cold for the next. And they also have mood swings, vaginal dryness, and vaginal secretions are being reduced as estrogen reduces in the body, which causes that vaginal dryness. Now this vaginal dryness causes dyspareunia, basically painful sex related to that vaginal dryness. So just think about that raisin, right? The older we get, the drier we get, the more wrinkly, and everything becomes less elastic. So we often educate clients to use some type of water-based lubricant. Now switching over to actual menopause here. This is sensation, or basically stopping, of menses for one full calendar year. The key term there is one full calendar year. Now the biggest thing is the loss of estrogen. So we see all the same issues as above, but just a lot worse, right? Major hot flashes, major vaginal dryness, and even the ovaries become atrophied to one to two centimeters and are not palpable after menopause. Now moving on to atrophic vaginitis. So let the name help you. Look at that first word, atrophy or atrophy. Think about a hard trophy. Simply think, what population do you see atrophy or atrophy with? Well, that's with our older populations, right? Now, some common signs and symptoms we might see is postmenopausal itchiness, dryness, even painfulness, as well as mucoidal discharge or mucoid discharge, basically meaning it's flecked with blood or little tinges of blood there. And this is due to the thinning of the epithelial layers from estrogen deficiency. Now, we can also see pale, dry mucosa that bleeds easily, and even a decrease in vaginal secretions, as mentioned before. Now, a treatment we can use is to give vaginal creams that are estrogen-based, which comes with concerns. So we only want to use water-based lubricants and not Vaseline here. 